Hello all and welcome to um, another Legs Matters Live Natter. Um, my name's Leanne Atkin, I'm a vascular nurse from Pinderfields Hospital and as you know I'm the chair of the Legs Matters campaign. I am so so pleased and very grateful to be joined today by Mr Paul Curley who is a vascular consultant within Mid York's Hospital um, and one of my um, wonderful colleagues. Uh, Mr Curley's joining us today to talk really about lower leg cramping um, and what does this truly mean? Paul, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Leanne, lovely to see you and delighted to be here and hope we can uh, help with some of the queries and questions that may be out there. Um, I note that you are wheeling out the old folk today, so I, I apologise to your audience that uh, you can't get a younger, better looking version. You'll have to do this time. Um, so as Mr Curley said, we are here live, both of us today. So if you have any questions, please, please put them in the question and the answer um, or within the text chat button. And we'd be really, really um, happy to answer any questions related to lower legs um, at the end of this session. Um, so just to kick off, um, we are really specifically talking about arteries today um, and what happens when patients experience problems with them. So can I just ask you, uh, Mr. Curley, uh, to tell us a little bit more about uh, your lower leg arteries. What do they do and how do they go wrong? Absolutely. So uh, clearly arteries are a vital part of our makeup and they crucially bring uh, the circulation, the blood from the heart and lungs out to the periphery of the body. Uh, we're particularly interested today in talking about the arteries that, that bring blood down to the lower limbs, to the legs, and perhaps it would be of use just to briefly describe where they run and what they do. So um, we talk about the aorta being the large tube, which the part that, that we're interested in runs from really just about the bottom of your chest in the front, um, through the diaphragm, the sheet of muscle that sits underneath the lungs and separates the chest from the belly. And that straight single tube, the aorta, runs down the back uh, of your belly to about the level of your tummy button. And at that point, it splits into two and they traverse going through the pelvis to the groins on both sides. So the aorta has decide, divided at the level of the tummy button to become the iliac arteries, and then they become the femoral arteries in the groins. And then they cascade down through the leg uh, all the way down to the foot. And there are typically four places where we can feel pulses in the blood vessels. So if you will ever go to be examined by a doctor, they may feel for a pulse in your groin. We call that the femoral pulse behind your knee, the popliteal pulse on the top of your foot, the dorsalis pedis pulse and behind the bony bit on the inside of your ankle, which we call the posterior tibial pulse and the presence or absence of those pulses helps us to determine whether or not you may have a degree of furring up or narrowing of your arteries. So um, what, what's the main things that can go wrong with the arteries? You mentioned that the, the narrow and fur up. What, what does that mean? So we deal with patients with all sorts of problems with their arteries, and that can range from having a, a motor car accident um, through uh, maybe a dislocation of a major joint, such as your knee, which uh, can damage the artery behind your knee, the popliteal artery, to stab injuries. But a large proportion of our work is actually relating to patients where the arteries are becoming narrowed, diseased, uh, and the flow of blood through them is becoming restricted and that can go on to form a complete blockage or an occlusion of the artery. The things that cause that to happen typically are um, the deposition of arterial disease within the wall of the artery and that is a, a combination of factors but the things that we worry about are cholesterol, cigarette smoking, diabetes. They're the three sort of major groups that can contribute to that furring up, that, that relatively common condition that is associated with increasing age. So if, if, the, if patients have a, uh, problems with their circulation and narrowing of the arteries, what are the first symptoms that they often experience? So of course, importantly, um, we, we should say that, that many patients don't have any symptoms. So 
um, they, they may have disease of the arteries. Indeed, it's a fairly normal part of, of aging in the Western world. So by the age of 70 or 80 years of age, many of us will have identifiable narrowing of our arteries to our legs, to our brain, to our heart but we may never suffer symptoms from them. So the presence of that is simply a, a consequence of aging and how we live in some people, but it can be exacerbated or made worse by the three things we've mentioned, cigarette smoking, uh, cholesterol, and diabetes. Um, moving on to your specific question, if people do have symptoms, then this first symptom they may have is of a cramp-like pain in one of their muscles. Typically, we note that in the, the bulky muscle at the back of the leg, in the calves. And we have a, a, a term for that. If you had pain in your chest related to your heart muscle after you'd been exercising, we might call that angina. In the lower limb, we call a similar pain that comes on in the bulk of the muscle after you've been exercising as intermittent claudication. It can affect other muscles, but commonly you would feel that in your calf muscles first. And, and, and how does this feel for, for a patient? And how would I be able to distinguish if this is normal muscle cramp versus a problem with my arteries? Yeah, really good question. So we, we get a lot of people coming in saying, I get a lot of cramp in my legs. And, and, and it's quite simple to then just ask them a few questions. Is that cramp that you get when you're asleep in bed at night? If the answer to that question is yes, then that's very unlikely to be anything to do with your arterial circulation. So the, the cramp we're talking about, the, the, the sensation is very similar. So it, it's, it's not typically a sharp pain. It's typically a gripping pain in the muscle bulk, which can build up a bit like a crescendo as you do exercise and typically will ease when you stop doing exercise. But that's different to a very similar symptom that you can get asleep in bed or resting in the chair where your muscle goes into a similar painful uh, condition, maybe actually distorts your foot or pulls your toes down. That's a cramp, which typically is nothing to do with your arterial circulation. So if it comes on at rest, it's unlikely to be due to your arteries. If it comes on during exercise, it may be due to your arteries. Now, of course, very uh, experienced runners football players, cyclists will all get cramp after exercise, but that typically can be stretched out, settles, and they can go back to exactly what they were doing beforehand. With arterial pain, it comes on with exercise, it may ease with rest, but it'll come on again after further exercise, typically. Yeah, and, and we tend to find, don't we, that it's that repeatability that, that raises our heckles in terms of that this could be a problem with the arteries. So patients often describe they can walk quite pain-free for 200 yards, and then at 200 yards they have this vice-type like crampy pain, which has forces them to stop, slowly disappears after the stop for a time being, then they can start walking again, but then they have that repeatable pain that comes on. Absolutely. And I think there is one other point we should make, and that is that people can describe quite similar symptoms, often starting in their buttocks, passing down through their thighs and into their calves. And if that comes on with exercise, it may be the same condition, but it's affecting arteries higher up in the body. But they can get the same symptoms from prolonged standing. If they get it from prolonged standing rather than exercise, then that may in fact indicate that they have a problem with their lower back rather than their arterial circulation. So there are some subtleties here, but in general, a vice-like cramp-like pain in a muscle bulk that comes on after exercise, stops when you stop exercise and recurs with further exercise, maybe arteries. If it comes on at night in bed while you're asleep or resting in your chair, it's unlikely to be due to your arteries. And if it starts when you have prolonged standing rather than exercise, it may in fact indicate your lower back. So um, if I have problems in terms of, I think that I have this repeatable pain in my lower leg when I'm walking, when should I seek help from a healthcare practitioner? Uh, well, um, a really good question. And I think the what's also important to understand here is that we would consider that the presence of these symptoms, the presence of disease in the arteries, 
means that you may have risks out with your legs. So we would always use this as a marker that there may be things that you can do in your life, in your lifestyle, in what you do that can give you an advantage to your well-being and maybe even your longevity as opposed to anything to do specifically with how well you're walking. So we would say that the presence of arterial disease that is causing symptoms is a good opportunity to seek advice from a healthcare professional about your general risks. Because we know very well that patients who have that symptom may also be at risk of disease from their heart or disease in the arteries to their brain. So therefore they might have a risk of heart attack, they might have a risk of stroke. And we know increasingly that there are things we can do that modify or reduce those risks. Some of those are very simple. We've mentioned cholesterol. So your diet can have a very major impact on your risk profile should you develop arterial disease. And remember that we've said earlier on, many people do, but don't have symptoms from it. So your diet is a really important point. Cigarette smoking is a vital factor in improving your um, long-term outcomes and indeed improving your survival. So getting off cigarettes is a really important thing. And a very important to stress that healthcare professionals of all sorts have access to help for you. They can help you get access to nicotine replacement. Um, you can have some, some access to self-help groups, to counseling and so forth. So one, if you're a smoker, please, please, please take the message very seriously that every cigarette you smoke is doing further damage. Every cigarette you do not smoke is a really good step forward. So that's an important point. Diabetes, we've said, you can help type 2 diabetes particularly. You can reduce your risk of getting type 2 diabetes by dietary factors, good exercise programs, and uh, weight reduction. So that's a very important thing. Leaving those three out, we would say that exercise is really important. So even if you're getting symptoms, one of the best things you can do is exercise. It might sound counterintuitive, it might even sound impossible, but, but there's plenty of good evidence that exercise is a really, really good way of reducing your risk from all other systems, but also improving the distance you can walk before that vice-like pain starts the claudication in your muscles. And the other thing that the healthcare professionals can do is give you advice about what might be possible from a medication point of view to lower your risk. And that might include looking at your blood pressure to see if it's optimized. It would certainly include making sure you're not diabetic or that if you are, that uh, your control is as good as it can be. And it might involve the suggestion that we would prescribe a medication, perhaps something like aspirin and perhaps something to lower your cholesterol. Now, there's a difference here between doing all of those things before anybody has symptoms, which we would call primary prevention, and doing them when people already have symptoms, which we would call secondary prevention. And by and large, the health gain is bigger when you've had symptoms and we put something in place to reduce your risk. So I think having these symptoms is important. There's a lot of self-help in here, but it is something that you, you should mention to your uh, primary care team in the first instance. And at the very least, they can assess your risks and hopefully reduce your risks um, of, of an event in later life. And I think, I think that's a really important point. And I think there's some very simple statistics which we can help with here. So there was a, um, a study by the Transatlantic Inter-Society Consensus Group, um, which suggested that um, some years ago, and this data was based in the 80s and 90s, so some years ago, the five-year overall death rate for people who presented with calf exercise-induced pain was 30%. Now, they weren't dying from the disease in their legs, but because it is a marker of these other conditions. The latest data um, in the 20, uh, talking about 21st century care suggests that that overall mortality is now reduced to perhaps 16% from 30%. So we've gotten better. 
not specifically at treating the leg problems, but at reducing people's overall risk. So it's really important to use this as a great opportunity to adjust what you're doing, modify your lifestyle, get out there and do some exercise, adjust your smoking habit if you've got it, hopefully stop it, make sure that your cholesterol is, is optimized and that your diabetic care if you're diabetic is also modified. And, and I think that that help really helps to clarify things because we see many patients, don't we, that we, we do all of this and, and they're really perplexed of why aren't you focusing on my leg? Why are you talking to me about my heart and prescribing me statins? And, and we have to remember that this really is a marker of a patient's overall health. People don't die of, of problems with their circulation of their lower legs but they die all the time from heart attacks and strokes. And it's about really trying to get over that message that the healthcare practitioner who isn't poo-pooing your symptoms of your lower leg, actually they're prioritizing as, you, as we need to, because we need to ensure we reduce your risks. And you've mentioned some of the really important ones, uh, but in terms of, you know, we know that statins have a bad name against them, but within peripheral arterial disease, we know it really helps to change your long term outcomes. So you spoke about the importance of, of exercise. And, and again, that's very counterintuitive that, you know, if, if, if when I'm walking, I get pain, my body's sort of telling me to stop, not to walk through it. Can you just explain a little bit more of why is that important and what happens in my body when I'm getting that pain? Absolutely. So, so the actual cramp itself is, we believe, largely due to the production of lactic acid. So very fit athletes, and I see a question in the, in the chat from, from a 33-year-old fit gentleman who's doing, doing a lot of exercise. Um, so, so I beg your pardon, not a gentleman, a lady who's doing a lot of exercise. Sorry, it was a, a quick look. I do apologize. Um, the, the, um, the difference is that you can build up lactate in your muscles at any level of exercise. So the fittest of, of athletes can hit the wall, as they talk about. And that can be when you begin to start producing lactic acid because you've exhausted the oxygen supplies. So that can be at you know, 15, 18, 20 miles into a marathon. So, so that's not because they've got claudication, but they're getting symptoms because of the buildup of lactic acid. And lactic acid typically builds up in, in muscle when the delivery of oxygen, and that's what the circulation is doing, what the arteries are doing, it's bringing oxygen in the blood into the muscles, and the consumption of oxygen by the muscles. Now, if you're a very fit person, you can ex exhaust your oxygen supply because you're doing so much exercise. If you've got arterial disease, you can exhaust your oxygen supply because you can't get any more oxygen in because you can't get any more blood in because there's a narrowing or a blockage in the blood vessel. So at that point, which might be 200 yards walking, it might be 400 yards walking, it might be 50 yards walking. At that point, your muscle has done the exercise, has consumed the available oxygen and is now flipping into lactic acid production. And that gives you the pain in the, in the muscle bulk. So why is producing lactic acid and giving yourself pain a good thing? Well, clearly that's not what we, that's not the goal. It's not to give you the pain, but it's exactly the same process as an athlete can get to. So every year, 27,000 people run the London Marathon or the Great North Run. I suspect very few of them have significant peripheral vascular disease, but I'm absolutely sure that a load of them um, get lactic acid production. What's happened though, is that those people have all gone from couch to 5K and beyond. So they've all built up their exercise tolerance. And if I tried to run a marathon tomorrow, I'd fall down in a heap. But I suspect like many other mid 50 year olds, um, I could train myself to do that over a protracted period of time. And so that's what we want people to do with intermittent claudication. So the more you do, the more your muscles will be conditioned to do the same amount of work with less oxygen and therefore they're less likely to produce lactic acid and therefore you're less likely to get the pain. But this is not a quick fix. So we have very, very good um, indications that 
um, if you do exercise regularly, then you can improve your walking distance. We talk about structured exercise programs, we talk about home-based exercise programs, and we talk about walking activity or walking advice. The best of those is a structured exercise program that's supervised, that maybe you get on a treadmill and you do exercise up to 30 minutes or 45 minutes, three to five times a week for 12 weeks. And we know that a significant number of people who do that will either double or increase their walking distance by at least 60%. So pain-free. So um, exercise is really, really good, not only for people who don't have arterial disease, but also for people who do. We then get asked, well, what's the best exercise? And, and I think the fundamental answer to that question is all exercise is good. But, but for sure, we know that walking is, is about the best. But we also know from other studies that there are these arm ergometers, which look like a pedal um, bicycle machine that you can actually mount on a table or a desk. And you can use your arms rather than your feet to do the exercise. And we also have studies that demonstrate that if you do that in a structured way, three to five times a week, you can actually increase the pain-free walking distance in your legs. So this is also about cardiovascular fitness and making sure that your entire body is improving its oxygen use, decreasing the amount of oxygen it needs for a fixed amount of exercise, and therefore you can increase the exercise you can do pain-free. And, and if you if patients take that approach, we know that majority of patients, if they commit to doing regular exercise, can really self-cure in a way, or they can self-improve to get that level of pain when they're walking at a distance that it's no longer impacting on their quality of life. Um, but is there ever an instance where a patient needs you in terms of, is there any times that a patient should stop trying to self-manage and really come to see a, a vascular surgeon? Uh, well, I think the, the important thing here is that the, clearly there's a healthcare team which it starts in primary care and, and an awful lot of good advice and good help is available through primary care. It's true that there are circumstances whereby the symptoms may have exceeded any benefit of those steps that we've discussed to date. And certainly there are treatments that we have available um, in secondary care in the hospitals that can help people. But it's really important for everybody to understand that whatever we do, whether that's trying to stretch an artery open with a balloon, which we call angioplasty, whether it's, it's trying to hold an arterial wall open with a stent, or whether it's doing a bypass operation, all of that is plumbing. It, none of it is, is reducing the risk to any other artery in the body. And all it's therefore doing is improving a symptom which is the pain when walking. So they may all be helpful, but on their own, they're not going to achieve the things that we've talked about so far. So the, the smoking cessation, the modification of your risk from cholesterol lowering, from good diabetic control, and doing that exercise program should always be the first thing. But yes, we have other options available to us as things progress, if, if they do. I think it's really also important to point out that the statistics would demonstrate that if you have symptoms of pain in your calf when you walk, it might be your thigh, but say it's your calf, um, and, and that's intermittent claudication. If that's what you have, and that's the only symptom you have, and you're not diabetic and you're not a smoker, then the chance of you progressing to an extent where your leg might be in jeopardy is of the order of 1% at 10 years. So it's really low. And that's an important point because all the things that we can do to you in hospital carry a risk, some of which are higher than that risk of leaving it alone and dealing it, it, with it with the exercise program. So. Yes, we have things available to us. And I guess the answer to your fundamental question is when should you seek help? I think that's when you have that relationship with your primary care team predominantly. So if they, if you can have confidence that 
there are things that you can do to help yourself. There are things that they can do to modify your risk. And actually, you understand the process, then the likelihood that you're going to need anything further than that goes down. Absolutely entirely appropriate that if the time is right, you seek advice, you seek referral, and we see you. But it's entirely possible you'll come and see somebody like me, and we will tell you exactly what I'm saying now. And you'll go away, hopefully, hopefully better informed, hopefully more understanding of what the process is, but actually not with another treatment planned. So, um, and don't feel in any way fobbed off about that, because that's not what this is about. This is about trying to modify people's risk, make them live longer, and better um, and keep them healthy for longer because at the end of the day it is a health service not an illness service thank you for all of that so we've had a couple of questions in we've had a, a question from debbie to, asking um, do we use the edinburgh claudication qu questionnaire in terms of helping to distinguish whether it's claudication or not and um, i know i certainly do i don't get the piece of paper out and ask every single question that's on it but i certainly use that to lead my conversations do you think that's a good way um, if you are dabbling in um, diagnosing whether it is claudication or not? Do you think that's a helpful questionnaire? Um, so, so I think I think all of these tools are helpful. Um, I do have a lot of sympathy for primary care colleagues because, you know, the Edinburgh tool is one of many and um, you know, they have not only people coming in with claudication, but all sorts of other ailments, which will all have questionnaires that specialists have have produced over the years. So I think it's very difficult to uh, expect primary care colleagues to have access to all of those. I personally think that the um, the conversation is is largely better driven by the severity of the symptoms. So. It, it, it's understanding what the consequences are. So I use a, an example to, to my patients. So we could have two patients who have exactly the same symptoms. They have exactly the same restriction at exactly the same distance. One of them might be a 75 year old retiree who really enjoys playing bowls, but can only manage seven ends before they have to have a sit down. The other might be a 40 year old postman who's or post lady who's putting um food on the table but is in danger of not being able to because of the consequences of the same symptoms so i i don't think of this in absolutes i think of it in personalized to the patient and the consequences of what they're they're facing and and that's why it's so good if you can have these conversations earlier on with your local healthcare practitioner because they can sort of bring the science into an individualized form for the patient that's sat in front of them we have had a, a few questions in about nighttime cramping and i think that you've been able to answer the fact that um, this isn't related to circulation but very briefly can i ask you then what is it related to and have you got any general advice for people out there that's having nighttime cramping and um, so very common and and my sort of sense is that that people are getting it more um than they used to uh, and, and i suspect that's partly because people are doing more exercise which is a good thing and um, i think i think generally those of us who may have over the years had to resort to uh, weight reduction techniques and i'm thinking particularly of dieting which i've i know it's hard to believe but occasionally i've had to resort to that myself and um, i found that one of the diets that had that badly affected me for for cramps which was nothing to do with arterial disease was the atkins diet and that was during the phase when i was on cold turkey for carbohydrates altogether. So I think there is an issue about the balance between nutrients and minerals. And generally, I think um, the absence of carbohydrates is potentially driving some of the cramp we're seeing and also um, mineral changes. So you'll, you'll see people who are very keen um, and, and semi-professional and professional athletes who will not only replace um, when they're rehydrating, they won't just replace with water, they'll replace with sugary, uh, salty drinks or snacks. So I think there is something about us not having the balance right. And that's probably the more important thing with nighttime cramps. 
Yeah, and, and I think often uh, underhydration makes the nighttime cramps more common. And just making sure that we are appropriately hydrated on a day to day basis will really help. Um, I'd just like to say uh, thank you um, for Mr. Curley to giving up his time. Um, he's also our um, deputy director, a medical director in the organization. And as you can imagine, right now is a very tricky time for um, NHS trusts up in Yorkshire. So I'd just like to say thank you so much, Mr. Curley, for giving up your time um, to give this excellent resource. If you'd like any further information, you will find it within the Legs Matters website. We have specific information relating to cramping and also relating to intermittent claudication. So thank you very much for joining us. And thanks again to Mr. Curley. Pleasure and thank you all.